With that said, John chapter 18, verses 39 and 40. I'll read those two verses and give you a bit of a, a reminder and uh, then move into our study in some uh, further detail and some depth. But again, I'm wanting to share with you things related to the, um, the event uh, before us where the Lord Jesus Christ is going through a trial before Pontius Pilate. And so in verse 39 of John chapter 18 and uh, verse 40, John writes, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Now, let me develop this with you as we're about to go through uh, several verses together in different passages. Uh, remember with me that Jesus has been brought before the Roman governor. His name was Pontius Pilate. And as Jesus was brought before the, uh, the governor, the, uh, the Jewish religious authorities had leveled charges against Jesus. And, and they very quickly presented their case against him. Now, they wanted to do this quickly because they wanted to be the first to present their case. Uh, they, they knew that this would help them to set up Jesus in order that he might be convicted. There's an interesting proverb, if you take notes. It's Proverbs 18, verse 17. You might want to mark this because we see this to be true where it says, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. That's one of the reasons why people try to hurry to give you their side of the story. They want to present to you their side immediately. Why? Because it's going to cause bias. Because if they can reach you first and convince you that they're sincere and speaking the truth, they may be able to cause you to, to judge harshly against somebody else who may very well be innocent. So the first one to plead his case always seems to be right. And that's what's taking place right now. They are pleading their case or they're wanting to make sure that, that Pilate is aware of their need and their cause. And, and what they're doing is they're bringing a charge against Christ because they want him to be put to death. Now, they brought what would be called a political charge because a political charge is a charge that a government official would consider. Because we know that Pilate said, you know, this is a question that's really religious in nature. We saw that earlier. Um, this is really... Uh, something that's uh, religious in nature. You have a law, this man made himself out to be the son of God and all of that, but that's religious in nature. And as a, a secular authority, as a, uh, uh, a person who represents the government of, of Rome, uh, why would you bring that to me? You, you, you judge him according to your own law, is what he was saying. And so they wanted to get around that because they wanted, uh, they wanted him to be put to death. And, and Luke told us in chapter 23, verse 2, that they created a charge. It was a, it was a political charge, something that, that would, um, would enable Pilate to be uh, forced into making judgment about it. It says they, they began to accuse Jesus, accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And so what that was was a political charge. They, they said he was perverting perverting the nation. That, the word perverting, when they use it in that context, means to, to turn aside from the right path. It speaks of corrupting. So they're corrupting the nation. And in what way? Well, they're forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. And that was the charge. It was a charge uh, that we don't use that term uh, today very often, but it's, it's a, a, the word is sedition. It's a charge of sedition. Sedition speaks of inciting rebellion against the government. And that's what they were saying Jesus was guilty of, that he was inciting uh, uh, sedition. He was, he was perverting the nation. He was causing rebellion against the government. Now, why would they say that? Now, again, in Luke 23, 2, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar is part of their charge. Well, remember, earlier in his ministry, there were a group of uh, Pharisees and, and people called Herodians. And they were trying to entrap Jesus. They asked him a question concerning paying taxes to the Roman government. It's found in Mark chapter 12. 
verses 15 through 17. So they're asking a question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That was their question. So Mark tells us in chapter 12, verse 15 through 17, he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius, bring me some money that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. They marveled at him. Give to the government what you owe the government, but never give to the government what you owe to God. And that's what he's pointing out here. You give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Caesar demands taxes. You give Caesar his taxes. But you never give to the government what only belongs to God. And so that had caused them to have this charge lodged against him. And that's why they said, we found this person or this fellow perverting the nation forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. That was the heart of that charge. Now, as we already have seen earlier that morning, Jesus had been interrogated by the Jewish religious authorities. Charges were brought against him. But as these charges had been lodged against him, Jesus did not answer those charges, and that provoked them. It got them upset, and so what they did is they actually pushed Jesus to do something unlawful. They, they pushed him to, to what we call self-incrimination. It's not lawful to, to be questioned in such a way that I incriminate myself. There have to be witnesses and other things involved. But what they did is they pressed him to what is called self-incrimination. You see that in Mark 14, 61 and 62. As they're pushing him to speak, he kept silent. He answered nothing. So again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And that is called self-incrimination, and that's what they did. They pushed him into making that statement. Now, Pilate's been listening to this as it's taking place, and he's unconvinced of any guilt at all on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ because he knew that the Jewish authorities hated Jesus. So as Jesus stood before him, Pilate made it clear, I find no fault in him. And he, he addresses the crowd. He makes it clear, Jesus isn't guilty. Notice verse 38 here in John chapter 18. In verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. I would have heard of these things. I would have heard that this man is perverting the nation, as you say. I would have heard that he was claiming to be a king. I would have heard that, but I haven't heard that. And as I'm listening to him and as I'm speaking to him, and we went through the things that were taking place that night, as recorded by John, as I listen to the things that are being said and the questions I'm asking him and the way that he's responding to, to those questions, I, I find no fault in him. There is absolutely no secular charge whatsoever that I can find him guilty of. I'd have heard if he was trying to pervert the nation. I would have heard these things, but I hadn't heard them, and therefore I find no fault. You have no case. And that's where John stops, but let's pick up in Matthew. I mentioned I'm going to turn you to Matthew. Let's turn to Matthew 27. I want to give you filler. I want to give you more information as to what is taking place here. And we'll look at Matthew 27, verses 11 through 18, because Matthew supplies more details concerning what is taking place here. So in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew being the first book of the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, Matthew says, Jesus stood before the governor. The governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, it is as you say. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, not one word. 
so that the governor marveled greatly. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? Now notice verse 18. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. And so these are more details that you can supply to what John is writing to us in his chapter. Now notice how it says in verse 12, he was being accused by the chief priest. Notice it says he answered nothing. Pilate found nothing of which to accuse him. But his accusers wouldn't let him go. So what more could Jesus say? Pilate knew he was guiltless. What else can be said? It says in, in the midst of all of this that's going on, he answered nothing. And that's why in verses 13 and 14, Pilate said, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? Can't you hear what they're saying? Can't you hear what they're, how they're accusing you? Why are you not responding to this? And, and, but Jesus would not speak a word. He didn't answer him. And that's why in verse 14, when it says he answered not one word, that the governor marveled greatly. Why would he marvel greatly? Because Jesus wouldn't defend himself. This is something that, that Pilate had never seen before. It, it's just normal for somebody who, especially when they stand before somebody who can, who can, who can order the death penalty, it's just normal for, for that person to plead his own cause, to, to claim his own innocence, to, to vehemently do that, to, to cry out with great passion, I, I'm innocent, this is wrong, and yet he's not seeing anything like that at all from Jesus. In, in Proverbs 20, verse 6, it says, most men will proclaim each his own goodness. And that's true. And every person that goes to jail, whether they're uh, guilty or not, is always going to tell you that they're not guilty. Most of them will, or many will. They all proclaim their own goodness. And Jesus wasn't answering. Jesus was not saying, I am not guilty. He wasn't saying it at that point. He wasn't pointing that out. And that causes the, uh, the, the governor to marvel. Because the drive to preserve your life is the highest drive a human being possesses. That the drive to breathe, the, to, to live is that's the highest drive that you have. Some of you have been in the position where you've begun to choke on something, and, and, and you know how, how you, if you have, I'm sure that at least one or two of you have, how there's this incredible desire to breathe when you're choking. I was eating, uh, it's been a few years ago now, but we, were had, we had a barbecue at, at our house, and I took a bite and swallowed, and, and it, did, it got lodged in my throat. The meat got lodged in my throat. And I was just sitting there, and so it's, you, you know how you begin to try and swallow, and nothing's happening? So I'm just sitting there, and my then son-in-law is sitting to my left right here, and I look in his direction, He's busy watching the TV. So I got some water and I started to drink it to try to. And I spit all the water back up because the meat was lodged in my throat. And my wonderful son-in-law was more interested in the program. And so I got up and I walked past him into the kitchen area. My son David is there, and David sees me, and he says, Are you okay, Dad? Um, I can't talk. So I look at him, and I go, and I shake my head, No. Now, I haven't breathed in 15, 20 seconds. It's starting to build up time, and I, when you eat, you know, you're not taking in a lot of, of, of breath, and so I've got very little oxygen. So I look at him, and I shake my head, No. Now he doesn't know what to do. So he runs up and tries to do the Heimlich thing. And he starts lifting me up and throwing me all over the kitchen. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like a rag doll because 
My son-in-law, my ex-son-in-law was a, is a police officer trained in all of that. And so finally he looks and he thinks, oh, I, I ought to do something. <laughs> and he comes and grabs me. By now it's about 45 seconds to closing in on a minute that I haven't breathed. And my face is starting to get a little red. And he presses and thank God the meat comes out and I picked it up and sliced it and finished it off. <laughs> no. So I, I can tell you that the desire to breathe is a very intense desire. The desire to stay alive is a very deep, it's the number one drive we have, is to stay alive. We all know that. And each man will plead his cause. Each person will beg for their life. They just do. And this is why Pontius Pilate is marveling. Because in all of his years of, of, um, of being a judge, a governor, and all that he's done, he's not seen something like this where a man is going to be put to death in a very painful way, and yet he's not answering. He's not saying anything. And these are very, very serious charges. Jesus is not responding. And that's why in verse 14 here in Matthew 27, that's why the governor marveled, it says greatly. The word marveled isn't like he was amazed. The word marveled means to, to hold someone in admiration. He saw him in that way. You see, Jesus' response was actually a fulfillment of what God's word, a prophetic word in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, Jesus' response was actually a fulfillment of that prophecy concerning Messiah. Again, if you take notes, Isaiah 53, verse 7. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And Jesus is there by not answering, fulfilling the prophetic word of Isaiah concerning Messiah. Well, a person who said nothing in his own defense is unheard of. But Jesus was innocent. It was obvious that he didn't require a defense on his part. Now, now Pilate, on the other hand, I'll give you a little more insight into this Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate didn't need any problems. He was already in a bad position. At the time of the writing, he had governed the area for five years, and he had misjudged the Jews before. He, he, on one occasion, he deliberately offended them by having his soldiers carry Roman banners with an image of Caesar. Now, we need to know that the Jews considered these images blasphemous, and they asked for the removal, but he refused to remove them. And what he did is he herded a delegation of Jews into an amphitheater and threatened to behead them. But they bared their necks. They threw themselves on the ground. They defied him. He removed the banners. That's the kind of passion they had. That's the kind of faith that they had when the governor said, do something that violates your faith or I'm going to take your head off. They said, take our heads off. We're not going to blaspheme our God. Interesting how the church doesn't seem to understand that today. Secondly, he took money forcefully from the temple treasury in order to build a, a water channel. And when he did that, the Jews openly rioted. And so Pilate slaughtered many protesters. And then third, he had special shields that were made for the guard of the Antonia Fortress. And these, these shields had images of Tiberius Caesar engraved on them. And this time, Jewish leaders protested directly to Caesar. Caesar ordered him to remove the shields immediately. He's already caused enough problems. He doesn't need another one. He's looking for a way out. And so as he's speaking to him, he discovered something about him. He actually finds out that he had come from Galilee. Now, there's another ruler by the name of Herod. And Herod had for some time wanted to see Jesus. 
If you're taking notes, Luke chapter 9, verses 7 through 9 says, Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John, the Baptist, John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see Jesus. So this is something that had taken place earlier in uh, the ministry of Christ where Herod wanted to see this man. So um, when he was saying these things and, and those rumors were going about, uh, people were wondering exactly who Jesus was. He wanted to know who, who he was because there were people who were making or spreading rumors. Again, I, I mentioned it a moment ago, but... Some were saying John had been raised from the dead. Others, Elijah had appeared. Others, that one of the prophets long ago had appeared. And so this is something Jesus actually had to take care of. This is something that he had to speak about with his disciples. Why? Because his disciples had heard the rumors even as Herod had. When you go to Israel, and God willing, I hope someday if we're able to go back again soon enough, I hope that those of you who have never gone to Israel will have a chance to go because we go to a, an area called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is in the northern area. It's in the Galilee. And, and we've been there many, many, many times. And it, it's, it's a place where Jesus would often resort. He would often take time to vacation. It was a resort area. It was a very famous area uh, during his time. They had various ruins of various uh, pagan shrines and all. And they had, uh, they had uh, just a, a lot of paganism going on in that area. And so Jesus had taken his men up there, and they were all having conversation. And that's when Jesus said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? That's when he asked that, that very important question. And, and they answered. You know, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah. Say, some say John, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And that's where Jesus said, but, but who do you say that I am? And, and that's when... The Apostle Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so that it is in that area that Jesus provoked through a question, a response from his men, so that a confession of faith concerning who he is would take place. But these men had heard the same thing Herod had heard. Herod had heard the same thing. John, Elijah, one of the prophets... And so this was common at that time. Herod had heard of who Jesus is, was wondering who he is. Who is this man that's doing all of these works? Who is this man with such compassion? Who is this? I want to see him. So he's been desiring to see him for some time. And so what happens? Well, Pilate hears that, that uh, Jesus is from the Galilee, from the north. So he thinks, man, I got my way out of this mess. You see, Herod had responsibility for what took place in the north. So Pontius Pilate actually sent Jesus to see Herod. You see, Herod was in Jerusalem. And so Pilate sent Jesus to stand before Herod, hoping to, to get out from underneath this problem. If you take notes, that's found in Luke 23. So while before Herod, Jesus refused to answer any questions that Herod posed. The chief priests and the scribes were accusing Jesus before him. And in Luke 23, 11, it says, Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him. They, they arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, sent him back to Pilate. And it says that when he went back to Pilate, that Pilate and Herod became friends that day. Well, when Jesus returns to Pontius Pilate, Pilate continues trying to get Jesus released. He makes it clear. After closely questioning Christ, he finds no fault in him. His solution is simple. I'm going to chastise him, and I'll release him. So in verse 15, it says of Matthew 27, At the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Well, there was some kind of custom at that time, but there's no information as to how it began. But we know Pilate was more than willing to let Jesus go. 
And, and uh, it would seem that he thought that they might want Jesus to be released. But verse 16 here tells us they had a notorious prisoner. His name was Barabbas. If you take notes, Barabbas means son of the father. That's how that's translated, Barabbas. And he was a violent revolutionary. When you look at Barabbas and you see Barabbas being next to Christ, you know, the two as choices, it's obvious that the world chooses the notorious. He, he is, a, he is a, uh, a rebel. He is, he is a violent oppressor. And that's much more appealing to the flesh. It says in Mark's gospel, chapter 15, verses 6 through 8, it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who committed murder in the uprising. And the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. They wanted Barabbas. Whom do you want me to release to you is the question. Barabbas or Jesus? He knows, and notice verse 18 here, he knows that Jesus was delivered to him because of envy. Envy is a horrible sin. It's a spiteful jealousy. Jealousy has been defined as, as um, wishing you had something that somebody else has. Envy is wishing you had something somebody else has and they didn't. And so that's even worse. And so he knew that Jesus had been delivered because of envy. It's been said in Proverbs 27, verse 4, wrath is cruel and anger a torrent. Who's able to stand before jealousy? So it seems that what he's doing here is he's saying, listen, I'm offering you a choice. Jesus, who has who's already been, been beaten and everything, and perhaps that will cause them to have some pity, or Barabbas. Barabbas is a violent robber. He's an insurrectionist. Surely you're going to want the harmless one, the gentle one. Surely you're going to want that one over this violent guy who, who's been involved in so much so much insurrection and, and even, even death. Surely you're going to want the one who is the one of peace, the prince of peace. But no, they began to cry out and they began to say, give us, give us Barabbas. In John chapter 18, we can turn back there. In John chapter 18, the Bible simply says in verse 40, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. So they refused Jesus and they, they cried out. They cried out for a robber, and that prompted, uh, that, that was prompted by the priests and the elders. Uh, it says in Luke 23, 22 through 25, he said to them the third time, what evil has he done? I found no reason for death in him. I'll therefore chastise him. Let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of the, of the men and of the chief priests prevailed. Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. He released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent of the charge, but he gave in to their demands. He knew that Jesus was innocent, but he gave in to their demands. And again, that fulfilled Isaiah. Isaiah 53, verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut, out, cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Now, the spirit of the Lord prompted the memory of the apostle Peter. And Peter actually mentions this. He was in Jerusalem and Peter and John were ministering. They ministered to a crippled man, and he was healed. This is after the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus and after Pentecost. It's recorded in the third chapter of the book of Acts. And when the apostle Peter and John were about to enter into the temple area during the hour of prayer, through a gate that is called the beautiful gate, and they encountered a crippled man who was there late at the gate. They're waiting for people to pass by because... Religious people are generally more generous than the non-religious, and he had a, a prime spot by a beautiful place called the Beautiful Gate. We all know the story. I, I share it with you fairly frequently, how that as Peter and John were about to walk in, 
Peter sees this man who is laying there, knowing that he'd been there for a long time, and he looks down at him, and he says to him, look upon us. And it's interesting how Luke was prompted by the Spirit to write, and the man looking up, expecting to receive something. I find that interesting. Expecting to receive something. What he was expecting to receive was money, because that's why he was there. He was asking for alms or charitable gifts. And so he's expecting for them to hand him some some money and all of that. So he has this expectation to receive something. And that's when Peter said to him, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, I say unto you, rise to your feet and walk. And, and, and I, I'm always just taken by, by the description that you have of what took place at the time, how that the apostle Peter reaches down and you can see this guy as he's there. He's unable to walk, hasn't done so in who knows how long. And he reaches down and he takes him by the hand and he begins to lift him up. And as he lifts him, the Spirit of God is working a miracle of healing in him. And he receives strength in his ankles, strength in his calves, his knees. He, he has strength in his, in his, his thighs. His, he gets an instantaneous sense of balance. That's something that sometimes we forget about, by the way, in healings like that. Because a sense of balance is something that takes time. I mean, we have grandchildren who are right now um, very small. And one of our grandchildren is about a year and a half, and, and she, she's been carried around and enjoying life being carried around for a long time. She didn't feel, like, didn't feel like walking for a long time. So she's over a year old, and she's finally made up her mind. I think it's probably time for me to take a few steps of my, my own. And so we, we watch her, my Olivia, and she's a year and a half now, but when she was beginning to walk, and we watched her, and it reminded me of watching my kids because... What they do is they'll usually crawl to something, then they'll crawl up something, then they'll hold on to something, and then they'll sometimes just release one hand and hold on to the one thing to retain their balance. And then if you distract them, you know, they'll reach for whatever it is. Usually it's my wallet, and because they'll be doing that the rest of their life. At least that was true with my kids, my credit card. So when you hold it out, they reach for it. And if you pull it a little bit slowly, all of you parents know this, they'll lean towards it and then they move their little feet. And then that's how they begin to take their steps. It's usually something like that. But are they out there dribbling a basketball and jumping? No. Why? Because they don't have balance. Balance is something that's acquired over time and experience. Balance is something you develop. That says, keep that in mind when you read about Jesus healing these lame individuals. And in, in, in the book of Acts, in chapter 3, it says, walking, leaping, and praising God. Walking and leaping, that is a miracle you have to take into consideration. For him to even have balance, let alone walking and jumping and landing and walking and leaping and all of that, that's what took place. And that's why it was such a fantastic thing. And when that happens, I mean, by itself, it's fantastic but they're seeing this man. They're all recognizing him, that he had been there for a long time. He'd never walked at all. Everybody was familiar with him. That was his spot. That's where he, that's where he was always seated. It's kind of like you guys in church. I always know where you're at. You always sit in the same places. You have your little name written there. This is my spot. Walking and leaping and praising God. And then he grabs hold of the apostles and is holding on to them. And people are marveling. And in Acts chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, it says that Peter began to preach. And as he preached, he said, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. You denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. I'm always blessed to see the boldness of the apostle Peter. He didn't give him an excuse or make an excuse for him. He said, Pilate determined to let him go, but you determined that you would kill him. And that's what's taking place here. You see, instead of the prince of peace, they wanted a worldly leader, Remember in John chapter 1, verse 11, how, how John said he came to his own 
and his own did not receive him. His own rejected him. His nation and his people rejected him. And with that, I'm going to read Isaiah 53 and share a few things with you in verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 53, 1 through 3, and I'll close with these verses where Isaiah is writing and he says this. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Who has believed our report, is what he says. We have given you a message, but it's a message mankind refused to receive. Isaiah 53 is speaking concerning the declaration of Messiah to come fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But the question is asked, who has believed our report? And to this day, 2,000 years later, the same statement can be made. Who has believed our report? For the church has been reporting as declaring that Messiah has come, that the church has been declaring this for 2,000 years. And the report that he's speaking about is the message that God would send Messiah so that people might be saved. And, and he speaks in this way. Who's believed our report, this message of Messiah? And then he said, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is another way of speaking of God's power to save. In Psalm 44, verse 3, they did not gain possession of the land by their own, own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. So who has believed this message of salvation? A message that speaks of how God would send Messiah to save people. That God has the power and ability to do that. That God has made a way for people to be saved. Who has believed this? Because God has made that way for people to be saved, but the majority of those who hear that message reject it. This one that he sent to rescue is rejected. And that's what, that's what Isaiah was saying. The messenger, the one who was sent to deliver the nation, was rejected by the people he came to save. So who is believing our report? Who is being saved? Who is listening to the gospel? Who is listening to our word of salvation? God has a message of salvation, but not everybody receives it. He said in verse 2, He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Messiah, he's saying, is going to have insignificant, very humble beginnings. It's a picture of a dry, barren landscape with a small vine that is growing in the middle of nowhere. So he's got a very insignificant, humble beginning. He's pointing to Jesus Christ. He said in verse 2 again of Isaiah 53, he has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He's not going to be a commanding figure. There were studies done. I don't know that they'll be I don't know that that applies to the upcoming election that we have here in the United States soon. But there have been studies done over the years, and I've, I've, I've read the results of some of those studies over the years. And normally in a political contest, very often in political contests, I find this interesting, and, it's, 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 and it, seems to be, it seems to be true, else I wouldn't be repeating it to you. Um, very often the better-looking one wins. The taller one, the better looking one, very often the better looking person wins because people are attracted to, to the height, to the build, to the outward beauty. I mean, that's, isn't that what, what happened when, when Saul in the Old Testament was given the position of king over Israel? And it speaks concerning him how he was head and shoulders above 
all the rest. He was very tall, that he was very handsome. He had a pedigree from uh, coming from the tribe of Benjamin. He had he had uh, ancestral pedigree. He had unearned qualifications. He didn't do anything to to make himself tall. He didn't do anything to make himself handsome. He didn't do anything to get himself born into a very prestigious tribe. He didn't have, those are all unearned qualities. Those are all things that, that he was given. Those are all gifts. Those are things that he had nothing to do with. And, and yet when the people saw him, they said, surely this one here, he, 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 he's the king. He's handsome. He's tall. He's strong. And, and that's, how, that's how we are even to this day. If somebody if somebody's appealing in the flesh, if somebody has, is good looking, if somebody is, uh, is eloquent, articulate, if somebody's humorous, if somebody seems to, to, to have uh, some, some qualities that we admire, um, we're drawn to that. That's the way it works. But Jesus didn't. He has no former comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Now, that doesn't necessarily simply speak of him being plain looking. But most certainly when he was beaten, most certainly when the saliva was running down his cheek and his, his beard had been plucked out and his head was swollen with the crown of thorns. Undoubtedly, there was no beauty in him as they were looking at him. No form, no comeliness, no beauty. There was nothing there appealing about him. There was no splendor in him at that moment, no majesty. There was nothing visually that would draw us to him. I mean, even as he's standing there with Pontius Pilate, remember how Pilate in Mark 15, 2 asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He's looking at a man who's insignificant. Verse 3 tells us in Isaiah 53, he's despised, he's rejected by men. He's a man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. He's despised. The word despised means worthless. Rejected, he's unwanted. He was not worth defending and he wasn't worth caring for. As a matter of fact, he was worthless. He was unwanted. In John 1, 10 and 11, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him. The world didn't know him. He came to his own. His own didn't receive him. They rejected him. They didn't want him. They looked at him. There's nothing in him that makes me desire him. There's nothing about him that makes me want to follow him. Him, he was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. When Isaiah says he was acquainted with grief, that word acquainted is a Hebrew word that speaks of knowing it by experience. It wasn't that he read books on grief and grief counseling and how to deal with those who sorrow. When it says he's acquainted with grief, it means he experienced it. Jesus Christ, when you look at Jesus and you see him, when some, some messengers come and say, the one whom you love, Lazarus, is, is very ill, about to die. And you see how Jesus goes to the town of Lazarus, Martha, and his sister Mary. And how he goes there and he stands and speaks to both Martha and then Mary and goes to the tomb where, where, where his friend had been buried. And the easiest scripture in the New Testament to memorize is only two words where Jesus stood there. And, and John just writes poignantly, Jesus wept. Acquainted with grief. Because earlier in the story, it simply says, now Jesus loved that family. He loved them. He loved them. And there he is standing outside of a tomb, knowing what he's about to do. And, and still you see God in the flesh crying over lost humanity. Now you see him when he goes to Jerusalem and in his triumphal day of his entrance. Now, Luke tells us, and he stopped, and he looked at the city, and he wept over it. If you would have known, even you, if you had known this day. 
But you didn't. Not a stone is going to remain in you that's not thrown down. Think about that for a minute. He wept over a friend and he wept over a city. He was acquainted with grief. Jesus knew what hunger was. Jesus knew what thirst was. Jesus knew what betrayal was. Jesus knew what abandonment was. He knew all of those things. You know, there were times when I was a young believer and I was trying to grab hold of that, trying to learn that about my Savior. And very early in my spiritual walk and very early in the days of my coming to Christ, I began to pray something that I still do. And I, 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 I said to him, you know, you understand, you know, you understand, you know, you understand. There were times when, I, I don't know about you, whether you've ever been in that place where the words are just not sufficient. You don't, don't know exactly how to put into words what you're experiencing. And so I learned a long time ago to simply say, you know. You know. You know. Sometimes I've done it with great passion. Sometimes I've said that with great tears. Because he's acquainted with grief. You know what a broken heart is? You know what it's like to have your closest friends abandon you? You know what it's like to be misunderstood? You know what it's like to be hated without a cause? You know what it's like. He's acquainted with grief. Don't forget that, by the way. Please, don't forget that. Don't forget that. Sometimes we think we're all alone. We're not. You know, the psalmist speaks about God having our tears in his bottle. He remembers. He knows. He understands you. He knows your loneliness. He knows your sorrow. He knows he's aware of your fear. He's aware of all of those things, and he loves you anyway. Think about that for a minute. He knew what you would do with his message, and he gave it to you anyway. He knew what you would do with his love, and he loved you anyway. He knew, and he still gave his life for you. He's acquainted with grief. He's acquainted with your sorrow. He's acquainted with your fear, and he knows it by experience. As there he is in that, in that garden, oh, God, oh, Father, Father, if there be any other way, remove this from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There is no other way. There is no other way. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how straightened I am until it be accomplished, how desirous I am to fulfill that, to take upon myself that cross, to die in obedience so that I might be able to ransom people, that I might be able to rescue them so that they might have hope, so that they might have life, so that they may not perish and, 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 and spend eternal, eternity in judgment, how, how desirous I am to save them. And yes, he's acquainted with grief. And yes, he's there being rejected. And even though he's saying, I, I, I find no fault in this man, they're saying, not this man, but Barabbas. And John says that he was a robber. He was a thief. He was violent. He killed people. The world would prefer a Barabbas, a phony son of the father, over the true son of the father. The Bible says the response to him is we hid our faces from him. He was despised, rejected, and not valued. The psalmist in Psalm 69, verses 19 and 20 says, You know my reproach my shame, my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none for comforters, but I found none. Matthew 26, 67, they spat in his face and they beat him. Others struck him with the palms of their hands.
People wear crosses today as articles of jewelry, but they are instruments of death and torture. It wasn't easy for Jesus. It's not going to be easy for us. But it's worth it. Whatever you go through, in the end, you'll say it was worth it. Because if you've ever said to the Lord, God, make me like you, I want to be like you ever, with sincerity, he was a wounded healer. He suffered, and so will you. But I've discovered something in the, in the times of pain that I have over the years gone through. I've never been alone. I've never been abandoned. And I've never regretted the lessons I've learned because I don't stay in that crucible of affliction. I come out. And when I come out, I'm purified. And my life is different. My faith is stronger. My hope is deeper. My trust is greater. Because my God never fails. My God always delivers me. My God is always with me. I will never, never, never leave you, Jesus told us. I'll never abandon you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I'm waiting for you. I will welcome you. We'll have a great reunion, you and I. You shall see me face to face, and then you'll know whatever you went through was worth it because it ended up with you being here with me. And so I don't want Barabbas. I want Jesus, the Son of God, the true Son of God. And I see that he was rejected, and I see that he was despised, and I see that he went through all of these things. But he's the one I can go to when I'm not being understood. He understands. He's the one I go to when I feel a bit rejected because he doesn't reject me. And though he was despised and was not esteemed, Yet he is my king, and yet he's there for us. And so in this trial for Messiah, his own people are saying, give us Barabbas. But in fact, God gave us his son. Let's not forget that.